Hello, um, we've got uh, an example of a classic IB high-level style problem, one that looks um, deceptively simple at first, but um, manages to assess a variety of areas in the curriculum, from um, volume of revolution and to integration by parts, and there's even a little bit of algebra in here. Um, so what we're trying to do here is we have two curves, um, the square root of x times e to the x, um, and e times the square root of x. And um, we should learn a little bit about the way square root of x functions go. This is just going to be a vertically stretched square root of x, and um, this one is going to be an exponential growth function. It's going to have a little bit of square rooty numbers mixed in, but for large values of x, the e to the x is going to dominate the square root of x. So it's going to look like an exponential growth function in my estimation. Except maybe around zero, but that's fine. Anyway, the first thing we need to do is establish where these functions intersect. And uh, we can use inferences like when x equals zero, clearly both of these will be zero. Um, and even if guess and check, we can find that one would be one of the solutions. But we need to be a little bit more um, analytical in our approach to ensure that zero and one are not the only solutions here. So we set the equations or the uh, functions equal to each other. And uh, then we have to so find a way to solve. Here we're going to use factoring in the zero product principle when we subtract e to the x on both sides and uh, e times square root of x, sorry, and then factor out a square root of x. Um, then we get a product of two numbers whose product is zero using the zero product principle. We find x equals zero or x equals one. So that's where the two curves are going to intersect and those are the only two places where the curves are going to intersect. So um, I take those two points and I draw first a square root function that goes through that point that shows the vertical stretch and then we have a concave down or increasing and a decreasing rate. The other function is going to be a little bit sketchy in terms of what happens between 0 and 1, but we know that as soon as we cross the point 1e, the curve is going to grow exponentially. So um, we can infer that uh, this curve is going to be under the red curve based on that behavior. And this can be um, confirmed with technology, although this came on a non-calculator test, so we have to have a little bit of an analytical sense in order to be successful there. Anyway, the integral that will give us the volume of revolution of this particular shaded region, remember pi r squared h, and what we're doing here is we're subtracting out the cylinders formed from the second curve from the cylinders formed over the first curve, just so we get just the shaded area revolved. So um, we have to square both functions first. And at this stage, um, we can uh, try to look forward as to what we're going to have to do to integrate. In this case, e squared is a constant. And so this right here is just a straight up uh, linear function, very easy to uh, anti-differentiate. But this function is a product and is going to require integration by parts. What I do notice, though, is they both contain the factor x. Um, since I have to use integration by parts anyway, I factor out the x and then use this times this, which is a constant minus an exponential function. And both um, are easy to integrate and differentiate, and it is a product, so we can use the integration by parts algorithm just once rather than integrating two different things. So, integration by parts requires that we uh, identify um, two functions out of the set that we see here. One of the functions has to be differentiated and we would like it ideally to reduce our powers. The other function has to be integrable. We have to be able to find its antiderivative um, with little you know, pain and suffering. So um, the first candidate I use for u is any um, power of x that will be reduced by differentiation. So that's why I choose this. And then and getting the uh, u prime is simple, and then uh, getting the v prime uh, up to v, we have to remember that e squared is in fact a constant. So when I anti-differentiate, it's just e squared times x. Just like if this was a 5, its antiderivative would be 5x, same, tr same treatment. So we have to make sure we understand the difference between our constants and our variable expressions over here. This is now an exponential function, which when I anti-differentiate would have the negative 1 half added to a coefficient. So recall then, if I try to differentiate this, I would multiply by 2 for the chain rule, and that would get rid of the half, get me back where I was. Now, the, uh, the integral then that I'm trying to find is based off of this algorithm, which, um, remember, is derived from taking a product and differentiating using the product rule, and then going backwards then and integrating both sides. And so that gives you this uh, relationship between um, the functions and their derivatives. 
the important thing to recognize here is if we are um, integrating a definite integral like this, that the integral from u v has already been integrated and therefore needs to have its boundaries assessed or evaluated. Sorry, and uh, that's how we manage integration by parts for definite integrals as shown. In this case, we have our u times v, v, and then we subtract the integral. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So here we go from 0 to 1. Um, we evaluate, and we'll do that a little bit later. And then here we have the integral of u prime v, and the rest is all number crunching. So we leave that to be evaluated after we anti-differentiate this. And notice here again, this is a linear function. The e squared is a constant, so we treat it like a constant. And we just basically divide it by 2 as we raise the power to 2. And here um, we're going to uh, reverse the chain rule. So we have to take a half again of the initial half and get e to the 2x. And the rest, again, number crunching and evaluation. The important thing to note here is that when we evaluate this function at zero, the result is not zero. We have to be very careful when we do those kind of things, when we do mental arithmetic here. But one quarter times e to the two times zero, e to the two times zero is one, and we end up with negative one quarter here, which has to be subtracted. And I, I should put parentheses around here. Um, we have to subtract the difference, so there's a little bit. And that shows up here. I put in the extra parentheses here. So um, the rest, again, basic number crunching in algebra. I cleaned up some of the messes, got rid of some of the zeros, and now I can see that we can uh, subtract out the e squareds over 2, and we end up with pi times e minus 1 over 4. So here is basically the two fractions we added up, e squared minus 1 over 4 times pi. And checking it with Wolfram Alpha, um, I found the estimate 5.01795 to be equivalent to this expression. So don't forget to check your work before you move on to the next. Thanks.